Welcome to the intersection of faith and the culture. It's Wall Builders Live. We're talking about the hot topics of the day from a biblical, historical, and constitutional perspective. I'm Rick Green, former Texas legislator and America's Constitution coach, here with David Barton. He's America's premier historian. He's our founder here at Wall Builders. Tim Barton's with us. He's a national speaker and pastor and president of Wall Builders. And guys, later in the program, we'll have Erwin Lutzer with us. He's a pastor with a new book out called We Will Not Be Silenced. I love the title, We Will Not Be Silenced. Everything we talk about here at Wild Builders Live, though, we drive it back to that biblical, historical, and constitutional perspective. You can get that perspective on virtually every issue. If you go to wildbuilderslive.com and click in the archive section, you can look at all the different programs and guests we've had on, Foundations of Freedom Thursday programs, Good News Friday programs. There's a ton of information there. Check it out at wildbuilderslive.com. All right, guys, there's a lot of folks uh, that have been silenced, frankly, a lot of the church that has been willing to be quiet in order to not offend or or whatever other reason, to not speak truth. And so we need to be courageous, not be cowards, and actually speak up. David, you do a whole talk on this in the Biblical Citizenship class where you specifically talk about how important truth is, but you got to have the courage to speak that truth. Yeah, and, and that's why I really like the title of this book, because it's a declaration of intent. And, and you have to start by saying, you know, I hope I can be strong. I hope I can—you can't do that. You have to say, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be strong. I am not going to be silenced. You're not going to cancel me. And you have to make those type of determinations. This is part of a game plan. In sports, you have game plans. Here's what we'll do if this happens, et cetera. And this is making a game plan. You have to determine in yourself, in your heart, in your backbone, that I am not going to be silenced. I have things to say, and I'm going to say them. Yeah, and one of the things, too, as he goes through this book, there are several significant topics that are very relevant to where we are in culture. And one of the things that certainly, as, as Christians, so often we're looking for the answer, saying, okay, how, how do we address this topic? What, what do we say about this? And so I really appreciate the fact, too, that he outlines in this book several different topics, responses to things that are happening in culture around us. And this is one of the things that I think is also important as we look even in the Bible and Chronicles when it talks about the sons of Issachar. And it says that from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 men, and they were leaders of the tribe. They understood the signs of the time, and they knew the best course for Israel to take. One of the things that's significant as it identifies leaders is two things that these leaders had. They had an understanding of the culture in which they lived, but they also knew the appropriate response to the issues they were facing. And as Christians, we definitely want to make sure that we are informed of what the issue is, and then we want to make sure we have the right response. And I really appreciate that Pastor Lutzer made an attempt in this book to say, let's let's try to give Christians the right response to all these problems. So he identifies the problems, but then he also offers solutions which, of course, is probably the more important thing than just identifying the problem is how do we solve this problem? What is the solution? And, and I think that's certainly something as Christians we ought to be focusing on is saying, okay, so so what is the answer to this question? Obviously, guys, it's what we try to do here at Wall Builders. It's, it's the reason that we spend time every day on radio at identifying oftentimes what is the issue, but then obviously looking and saying, okay, so from a historic, from a constitutional, from a biblical standpoint, what is the right response? And again, that's why I, I'm, I'm grateful for what he— he worked to do in this book, trying to give Christians the right response for those cultural issues. Erwin Lutzer is, uh, actually was the pastor of a really famous church for a number of years. I think he was 36 years at Moody Church, and that's one of the more famous churches in the nation. goes back to the Second Great Awakening and the turn of the century revivals with D.L. Moody. There's Moody Bible College, etc. So very famous institution, very significant part of America's history uh, in the 1800s, early 1900s. So Urban Lutzer has had a lot of experience over those 36 years with dealing with a lot of issues and be a good voice to help us understand just how to address the issues today. Erwin Lutzer, our special guest today. Stay with us. Tim had a chance to interview him at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, a huge gathering in Dallas of uh, religious broadcasters from across the country, folks that are in all kinds of Christian media. And so Tim had a chance to catch up with uh, Pastor Lutzer in person and get this interview. Here we go to NRB after the break. Stay with us. You're listening to Wall Builders Live. This is Tim Barton from Wall Builders with another moment from American history. America is a special and unique nation. The average length for a constitution in other countries is only 17 years, but we've had ours for over two centuries. 
And our 4% of the world's population produces 24% of the world's gross domestic product. And every year, we produce more inventions and technology than the other 96% of the world combined. In 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville of France came to America, traveled the country, and in his famous book, Democracy in America, reported, The position of the Americans is therefore quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. This is the origin of the phrase American exceptionalism and affirms that America is unique because of the distinctive ideas on which we have been based, including inalienable rights, individualism, limited government, and the importance of religion and morality. For more information about American exceptionalism, go to wallbuilders.com. Well, welcome back. We are here with Pastor Erwin Lutzer, who is not only a pastor for many decades, he's an author and has now gotten into one of the most significant topics for our culture today. Uh, His book is called We Will Not Be Silenced. And Pastor, you look at a lot of the attacks in our nation where so many of the roots go to Marxism. And, and now we hear about critical race theory. We, on the program, we've talked about the the Marxist ideology and roots of critical race theory, but there's so much more happening in the culture than just those things. And, and I know you address a lot in the book, so I want to start with the book. What is it you're hoping to accomplish from the content of this book? Well, the ultimate reason why I wrote it is to help the church. You know, even when you talk about critical race theory, which I do quite extensively, it's always with a view to how should the church respond? Because what we want to do is to strengthen the church. I didn't write the book in order to reclaim the culture. I wrote it to reclaim the church. Now, why this book? I began to realize that the radical left in America does not believe that America can be fixed. It has to be destroyed Mm -hmm. and rebuilt upon a quasi-Marxist foundation. Now, you've probably covered this in other interviews, but people have to understand that classical Marxism was primarily economic. Mm -hmm. You, of course, have the revolutions in China and Russia. Cultural Marxism says we can achieve the same goals if we capture the law, if we capture education, the media vote for the right people, it can be brought in incrementally. So what I do in the book is I show that this explains the vilification of our history using race and using slavery, which of course was awful, no question about it, but using that as an excuse to totally vilify Mm -hmm. the United States of America, Overlooking, of course, the tremendous documents that founded the nation and so forth, and the 1619 Project, which I also refer to there, and show how it is bad history and really a Marxist view of the United States. What I do is I not only apply it to the vilification of our history. By the way, Schlesinger, who was a confidant of President Kennedy, said that history is to a nation what memory is to a person. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I know that if a person loses his memory, he becomes whatever people say he is, and they want us to lose our collective memories. But then I apply it to race. You think, for example, of Saul Alinsky in Chicago, a Marxist. He recognized that Marxist categories could be applied to the whole racial issue. I talked with a man who worked for him, and he said that We had good plans to help the under-resourced communities of Chicago, and he blocked them. He said, gentlemen, don't solve problems, use them. So what he began to do is to say, look, we can take Marxism, with its great emphasis on the whole issue of uh, oppression, which for Marx was the key to history. Mm -hmm. You know, men oppress their wives, parents oppress their children. God was the ultimate oppressor for Marx. He said, we can apply that to race. So what we can do is to talk about the oppressed and the oppressors and put them in these categories. And that, of course, as you know, is the basis for what we call critical race theory. Mm -hmm. The intention, the intention of all of those diversity studies is to keep the races divided, to keep them shouting at each other, blaming each other, and so forth. And we see that happening every single day here in America. And by the way, the church has an answer to that that the world doesn't have. But then I apply it to freedom of speech. You know, Marcuse was also a Marxist 
who believed, and he lived in the 60s. Now, I still remember him, but I can tell that you are too young to remember. It's a little before my time. A little bit before your time. He argued that if we allow freedom of speech, the capitalists will always win because they are the oppressors. So the only way that uh, Marxism can win the debate is if we tell the oppressors, be quiet, it's time for the oppressed Mm -hmm. to speak. So that, of course, contributes to it. And then a chapter that I have that I think is very important is on the whole issue of how propaganda works. So let me just tease you a little bit by telling you, and then we can flush that out later. The purpose of propaganda is to so shape people's view of reality that even when confronted with a mountain of evidence, they will not change their minds. In fact, and George Orwell shows this, the ultimate desire is that people enjoy their slavery Mm. and uh, take delight in it, actually, because in return, you know, they get certain benefits and certain protections. And so what you have is that happening in society. And collective demonization that we hear so much about, the cancel culture, same thing happened in Germany when... uh, You know, churches put up a swastika on the door of their church saying, when you come for the Christians, don't come for us because we actually are on your side. So what happens today is people are asking, am I woke enough to be seen as virtuous? Woe to the person who is on the wrong side of woke. Right. And that's where we are. And the church needs to be able to respond to this, the sexualization of children and socialism, and why it appears so attractive, but in the end, it becomes a paradise for parasites. Right. The words of Jesus to the church at Sardis strengthen what remains. Now, the reason that I feel so deeply about this message is I want Christians to be able to think through what the issues are, but I also want the church to be encouraged to stand strong. Mm -hmm. Both biblically and historically, the church has always had to do that. Absolutely. And and Pastor, as as we look at this, one of the things I'm so grateful for that you put in your book was not just identifying the problems, but offering solutions to the church. And so I want to talk about solutions for a little bit if we can. I, I know right now we have a lot of listeners, a lot of parents who are frustrated, actually probably many, many people who attend a church, and they might be saying, our pastor is maybe falling into a little bit of the woke category. We're seeing this actually literal denominations that are having infighting, that are that are dividing over this notion of critical race theory, of some of these Marxist ideologies. So first of all, what would you say to maybe the pastors out there or, or to people attending a church where this ideology is creeping in? What is the response for Christians if they're seeing this in their church? When somebody tells me, that social justice is a gospel issue, I have no idea what they're talking about. (laughs) Because the question is, I sure hope they don't mean what they seem to mean. Namely, that somehow you have to believe in social justice in order to be saved, and it's a part of the gospel. They probably mean that social justice is a fruit of the gospel, but then we have to ask the question, what is social justice over against biblical justice? Right. Because... People have to think through that issue. The simple fact is that social justice is all kinds of things. When you get a box with a label on it and it says social justice, open the box and find out what's in it. And what you'll discover is that it's sexual radicalism. Uh, You'll discover that it's environmental justice. Sure. Here again, propaganda where good words are used but used wrongly. There's marriage justice, and there's this justice, and all of that gets lumped together under the social justice label. Now, you asked a question. What about churches that get off track because they begin to preach, quote, the social justice gospel? And I want to say it as loudly as I can. If you can shout on radio, this is the place where (laughs) I want to do it. The gospel is not what we can do for Jesus. The gospel is what Jesus has done for us. And that message must remain clear and distinct and not have all of these add-ons. So in answer to your question, we could begin there and then we could talk about other things. But 
There are churches that are going woke, and they're doing it under the banner of social justice and critical race theory, too. And we have to respond to that. So this is something that, that clearly, and we've, we've talked about many of these issues and topics in the program before, is there, as Christians, we want to make sure that we are, are being guided by the truth of God's word. And so as you're pointing out, when you just, if you just judge the fruit of the social justice movement, if a Christian's promoting that, that fruit, it, 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 that's not a tree that's bearing good fruit. Those are not ideals that line up with what the Bible teaches us to be the truth of the way God created the world, of the way the world functions. And, and so as Christians, we want to be on guard against that. But now we know, we get emails from listeners periodically that say, okay, my pastor maybe is, is starting to promote and teach some of this stuff. And, and they're saying it because, because in this new notion of we want to love everybody, it means we should accept immorality and accept sin and, and embrace debauchery. If people are in church that maybe is going in the wrong direction, one of the things that, that we've encouraged is maybe talk to your pastor. That we would recommend not just getting up and leaving right away because if you can help redirect the pastor to truth, then maybe it can change the congregation going forward. But obviously there's different scenarios. So, so what would maybe some of your thoughts be for people if they are in a church that they're seeing it's starting to go woke a little bit? And of course, one of the answers might be really good option is to get the book, We Will Not Be Silent. I love that idea, actually. <laughs> I didn't write it for pastors only, obviously. It's written for the common person. But I think your advice is very well taken. Namely, don't leave right away because some of these pastors are genuinely doing that and they're confused and they mm -hmm. don't realize it. But let's take the issue, for example, of race, since you mentioned it. Critical race theory continues to tear apart what Jesus died to bring together. Right. If you look, for example, at Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, In Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek. Boy, did they ever have their differences. Yes. Barbarians, barbarians, they acted in a way that was barbaric. Bond or free Scythians. I looked them up. They were some kind of marauders. Mm -hmm. I attended a conference where a young black pastor gave a lecture on why is it so difficult to talk about race. It was very helpful. One of the things he said is, we don't have to agree on everything to affirm our unity in Christ. And that was very freeing because the Scythians and the Greeks and the barbarians, do you think they agreed on everything? No. But yet they strove for that unity. Christianity says this, at the foot of the cross, there isn't that much difference between us. We are all created in God's image. We are all his image bearers. We are all sinners. Mm -hmm. We meet together. And then we ask ourselves the question, now that we've come to the foot of the cross to receive forgiveness, what can we do together to make things better? At the Moody Church, where I served for 36 years, on any Sunday morning, we had people from more than 70 different countries of origin. Wow. Because we said Revelation 5, right? The people from every tongue and people and nation. But we didn't spend our time blaming one another or focusing on all of our differences, though the differences were there, we focused on our unity in Christ and asked, what can we do together as a church? In other words, to put it in a single sentence, Christianity says, we do not have a skin problem, we have a sin problem. Absolutely. And that's the answer to critical race theory that keeps tearing apart that which Jesus died to bring together. And I love the Apostle Paul's conclusion that we are all one in Christ. Where we find the unity is in the common bond we have in a, a common Savior, the one that we look to Jesus as the author, the finisher, the completer of our faith. Pastor, it's such a great word, and, and, and literally I feel like we could talk for days about some of the content of your book, and we probably need to have you back on to talk more about some of the content of your book. But I know right now there's, there's people listening saying, okay, I, I, I want to know more. You were a pastor for literally decades. If, if they want to learn more about some of the things you've taught, if they want to be maybe mentored and discipled by some of your teachings, where's the best place to go to get the book and to get more of your resources? First of all, with regard to the book, they can get it wherever books are sold, even Amazon. You know, there are those who say, oh, don't mention Amazon, but people go to Amazon. They can go to christianbook.com 
christianbook.com. If they want to know more about my sermons, which are online, my blogs, and all those things, they can go to moodymedia.org, moodymedia.org, and that will bring up all this information. And remember this, it's my heart to help the church. We will not be silenced. It's wonderful. Okay, everybody, you need to check it out. The book is We Will Not Be Silenced. Check it out. Also, Pastor, I'm sure people are going to be looking for your sermons and more of your teachings, but thank you so much for being with us today. Look forward to having you back on in the future. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And we'll be back in just a minute with David Barton and Rick Green. Hey guys, we want to let you know about a new resource we have at Wall Builders called The American Story. For so many years, people have asked us to do a history book to help tell more of the story that's just not known or not told today. And we would say very providentially, in the midst of all of the new attacks coming out against America, whether it be from things like the 1619 Project that say America is evil and everything in America was built off slavery, which is certainly not true, or things like even the Black Lives Matter movement, the organization itself, not, not the statement Black Lives Matter, but the organization that says we're against everything that America was built on and this is part of the Marxist ideology. There's so many things attacking America. Well, is America worth defending? What is the true story of America? We actually have written and told that story, starting with Christopher Columbus, going roughly through Abraham Lincoln. We tell the story of America, not as the story of a perfect nation or a perfect people, but the story of how God used these imperfect people and did great things through this nation. It's a story you want to check out. Wallbuilders.com, The American Story. We're back at Wobblers Live. Thanks for staying with us, and thanks to Tim Barton for grabbing that interview with Pastor Lutzer out there at National Religious Broadcasters. And, uh, man, the whole concept of even courage, I, I remember, uh, you guys might remember when Ken Graves, Pastor Ken Graves, gave to the, came to the Capitol and spoke at Patriot Academy, and he told the students, he said, it's not an option. He didn't say, you know, if you feel like being courageous, be courageous. He said, have not I commanded you, be strong and of a good courage. And I love that message. I, I think that's that's the way we've got to approach this. We can't be silent because God commanded us to be courageous, even in the face of all the criticism out there today. And, and I thought along with that, that the focus is really good. As he pointed out, he said, look, I didn't write this book to reclaim the culture. I wrote this book to reclaim the church. And I thought that's exactly right, because the church, if they're doing what they're supposed to, you're not going to have the culture we have. Um, If we can reclaim the culture and get them to have courage and get them to stand up and get them to talk the way they should be talking, then the culture will shift. So I thought the focus was really good on that. I mean, the church, in in many ways, needs a swift kick in the tail, and they need to get engaged because they are the ones who have the answer. That's what God gave them. That's what the Scripture is all about. That's what our relationship with God through Christ is all about. But if we don't get engaged and don't get involved, I mean, it's like Jesus said, you're, you're taking a, a candle, you're hiding it under a bushel, you're, you're keeping the salt in the shaker, you're, you're of no use except to be trodden underfoot. And so the courage that Ken Graves talks about and the fact that it needs to happen with us and not the culture, yeah, the culture's all messed up, needs to be fixed, but we don't sit here and complain about it. We've got to get engaged and do it. And so getting some answers on how to do that, the fact that he's trying to equip the church, that is the right thing to do. And hopefully everybody will get themselves equipped so they can go be good soldiers in the culture war. Yeah, and I think they're hungry for that too, right? They're, they're, they're feeling silenced right now. And there's this self-censorship that you talk about, David, where people tend to just self-censor out of fear that they're going to be canceled on, on social media or that it's going to upset somebody uh, that's a friend or family or, or whatever. And so they're they're already feeling silenced, and so this idea of we will not be silenced, and here's why, and here's how to equip, and here's the things you can uh, do effectively, um, you know, there's definitely a hunger out out there for that, and to know that they're not the only ones feeling that way, because a lot of times Christians feel isolated today, and they feel like, well, man, we must really be in the minority now, and most people in America must be anti-Christian and not believe in the things that, that we're talking about here. Uh, when in fact the opposite is true. I mean, they, there's at least they have the label of Christian, even though as we know from Barner's research, they don't have the world view because we haven't been teaching these things. Uh, but I think people need to know that they can be, they can have a voice. They don't have to be silenced. They're feeling that right now. They're concerned about the the crackdown on our speech and all of those things. So this is going to be a really equipping opportunity for for believers. It is, and I, and I hope it changes expectations as well. I, I think a lot of us, we want to get along. We want to see the culture get along. We want people to, to stop yelling at one another, et cetera. 
but I was in the scriptures this morning, and I was really struck with what Jesus said. He said, look, I did not come to bring peace to the earth. I came to set a, a, a man against his son and, a, and the daughters against the mother. He said, when I start telling this, people are going to get offended over some things, and they're not going to like it, and it's going to bring splitting and division. And we can't let the fact that people don't like it back us off from talking about it. I mean, you, you have to carry the message forward. And Jesus said, look, that's, that's a consequence of, of my lifestyle, of, of me saying these things. These are not things people want necessarily to hear, but they are right. And I thought it was interesting, too, how Dr. Lutzer was talking about the fact that there's a big difference between social justice and biblical justice. And a lot of the church is buying into social justice, and we're hearing that out of a lot of pulpits. But that's not the same thing as biblical justice. And getting it done the way God wants it done with his standard is what's ultimately going to work. And we may think that if everything's nice and peaceful and quiet, that's the best way. That's not the best way because that doesn't make the best policy. It has to be right for it to be that way. And that, again, comes back to the church getting some backbone and getting some information and standing up. And not just the church, every one of us individually, having the yeah. courage to stand up and stand for those convictions. Yeah, I love that, man. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes we do. We just say, oh, it's the church's fault. It's the pastor's fault. What are we doing individually? We've got that responsibility as well. Uh, pastor Erwin Lutzer, our special guest today. Uh, the book is called We Will Not Be Silenced. And uh, we're actually going to have Pastor Lutzer back tomorrow to talk more about the book. Thanks so much for listening today. Be sure and visit our website at wobblerslive.com today. And we'll have links to where you can get the book as well. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Wobblers Live. Stand undivided.